Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Ray from the Bloomfield Public Library. Thank you for joining us tonight for Watershed Connections. We have Heather Geis here from the Farmington River Watershed Association. And I'd also thank our partner, Stephanie Baramian. She is our Bloomfield Town Environmental Planner. So I'm gonna turn this over to Heather now. All right, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, uh, Bloomfield Public Library for having me tonight. Thank you, Stephanie, for helping coordinate this. Um, thank you to Mary Rickle Pelletier, who started off our series here a couple weeks ago. Um, it's nice to see everyone. Thank you guys all for coming. I see a couple of familiar names here, so that's exciting. Let's go ahead and get into it. So tonight, let's see. There we go. All right, can everybody see my screen all right? We've got my title here, fantastic. Tonight, we're gonna make some connections. We talked a little bit, oops, about um, watersheds with Mary last week. So I wanted to go ahead and just tie in a little bit about how the park, inter uh, the park watershed and the Farmington River watershed interact with each other, interact with the Connecticut River and its watershed. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about stormwater pollution, because that is the biggest threat facing most of our watersheds here in the Northeast right now, including the park and the Connecticut and the Farmington River watersheds. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what you all can do to help mitigate stormwater pollution and protect our drinking water resources. So since I accidentally clicked to the first slide, we'll get started with what we do at FRWA. Um, we're the Farmington River Watershed Association. My name is Heather Geist. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager. We're a nonprofit organization that started in 1953 by some angry citizens, basically. Um, we aim to protect and preserve the Farmington River and its watershed through stewardship and advocacy, education and outreach, and water quality research and monitoring. And we just want to acknowledge that we and our entire watershed is on the lands of a lot of other people that took care of that space before us. Uh, we do want to be good environmental stewards in the way that they were and follow some of those same uh, principles that they used. And we thank the people that were in our watershed before us taking such good care of it. So tonight, as I mentioned a little bit, we're gonna talk about watersheds locally. We're gonna talk about stormwater pollution, what you can do to help mitigate that pollution and how we can help conserve drinking water which the Farmington River provides a good amount of. For this slide, it's a little quick video to talk about what a watershed is, just a recap. I know Mary talked about it a couple of weeks ago, but it's a really interesting concept that we're all familiar with, but sometimes hearing it defined in specific terms makes you see it a little bit differently. So if I could just get um, a thumbs up from Sarah, if you can hear the audio once I play this, that would be great. Thanks. Can you hear? No. Nope. No, try, try it again. I thought I heard, I start, thought I started hearing it, but just make oh. sure you have your share. Can you hear music? I heard what is, <laughs> but I don't hear anything now. All so right. I don't know, did you, did you click the share sound on Zoom? Oh. That's Um, there we go. I don't know. I think we'll just talk about it the old fashioned way, I guess. <laughs> so a watershed is going to be an area of land that drains into any specific water body, um, also known as a drainage basin. So the Farmington River watershed would drain eventually into the Farmington River. The Farmington River watershed being part of the Connecticut River watershed flows into the Connecticut River and the Park River watershed is located south of part of the Farmington River watershed. Um, I do have a map, a small picture here of the town of Bloomfield. The green would be the Farmington River watershed over here on the um, west side of Bloomfield. That would be the state park over on the east side. We've got the Mill Brook area, which flows into the Farmington River. Uh, the gray part, which is most of Bloomfield, is the park watershed. And the little bit of blue in the corner there is 
directly Connecticut River watershed. So that piece of land, when the rainwater falls, all of that water is gonna wash directly into the Connecticut River without hitting the Park River or the Farmington River. So quick facts about the Farmington River watershed. We cover 609 miles in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Our headwaters are located in the Southern Berkshire region. Um, the river flows in all four cardinal directions from Beckett up here all the way down to where it takes a really sharp turn in Farmington, goes up north and then turns and heads east to the Connecticut River where it meets it in Windsor. Um, we have several reservoirs here that are owned by the Metropolitan District Commission, the MDC. They provide drinking water for all of Bloomfield, as well as a lot of other residents in the area. So the Farmington River is an important natural resource for drinking water. It's also really important for fisheries. We've got great water quality in a lot of the watershed. And we're hoping to always make it better. The park watershed, again, it's just a little bit south of us. It's a smaller watershed, 77.2 miles. Uh, it's located in six towns. We've got the north and the south branch of the Park River, as Mary mentioned a couple weeks ago, and they actually go underneath Hartford to meet the Connecticut River. Here we can see the entirety of the Connecticut River watershed from up in the corner of New Hampshire, Maine, and Canada, where it comes down between New Hampshire and Vermont, forming the border through Massachusetts and into Connecticut. And eventually you can see at the bottom of the screen here that it empties into the Long Island Sound. So every watershed for every river that goes into the Connecticut River is part of this Connecticut River watershed, which is part of the Long Island Sound watershed. It's all connected all the way down for 410 miles. So stormwater pollution, as I mentioned, is one of the biggest threats that our watersheds and our surface waters in the Northeast United States are facing today. Um, around here, we have what's called non-point source pollution, which essentially means that we have pollution from stormwater runoff that's coming from everywhere. It's not coming from one specific point. A point source would be something like an industrial facility or a factory that's dumping from a pipe directly into the river. When it comes to stormwater pollution, the pollution is coming in from everywhere that that rainwater is falling. It picks up contaminants and carries it into our, and our uh, surface water systems. So some of the big pollutants that get carried in this stormwater include high temperatures. Um, basically, rainwater that falls on our development surfaces, we call them impervious surfaces because the rainwater cannot go into them, it will flow off. Um, that would be our asphalt, our sidewalks, our roofs. All of those are going to heat up that water really quickly before sending it into the river. Uh, we've got nutrients, bacteria, chloride, sediment. We're going to get into the rest of those in a little bit. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Starting with temperature, um, as I mentioned before, it runs off our impervious surfaces. It heats up our surface waters. The issue with that is that streams are meant to be cold, to be healthy. Um, cold water holds more oxygen for the animals that live in these streams. So as you can see on the picture here, on the left-hand side, we have a mayfly larva. On the right-hand side, we have a stonefly larva. Those are both really important food sources for fish and other organisms that live in the water. In the middle here, we have a slimy sculpin. All three of these species are sensitive to changes in temperature in the water. They only like cold water. So if you're in an area that's highly developed, where we have a lot of parking lots, a lot of roofs, the water that's going into the water, the surface waters during a storm event is going to heat up that water and make it a less um, hospitable habitat for these kind of organisms. Um, climate change is another issue, of course, that's facing our surface waters today. Everything's heating up a little bit, but we can still help with this temperature issue by disconnecting these parking lots and impervious surfaces. Uh, Mary touched on it last week. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later as well. 
This picture here, this nasty looking thing, is the housing that we use for our hobo temperature monitors, F FRWA. Um, we put those in the water in May. We take them out in September in a lot of cold water streams throughout our watershed, um, more so in the upper area, as well as in the Salmon Brook area, which is up in Granby and Heartland. Uh, we leave them in there until September, and then we collect the data on how hot the water got in the summertime. So our next big form of pollution is nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, the picture here is of the Simsbury Water Pollution Control Authority, one of their tanks. Um, our water control facilities definitely are sources. They are actually point sources of nitrogen and phosphorus in our system. However, there are regulations that uh, mandate them to have certain efficiency gradients of removal of these kind of nutrients so they're they're being kept track of of course there's always room for improvement as technology improves things like that different ways of cleaning our water but overall not too much to worry about at this point we have plenty of regulations in place making sure that our water cleaning treatment plants are putting clean water into our streams or as clean as they can practically do um, stormwater runoff however especially when it's coming from agricultural areas or high turf areas where we have a lot of fertilizers and pesticides is a big contributor. <coughs> Pardon me. And the issue with extra nutrients in our surface water systems is that these nutrients can wash downstream into a reservoir like Rainbow Reservoir we have in Bloomfield pictured here. The nutrients then will feed species of algae that are living in the water, planktonic algae, also cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic bacteria that make their food from sunlight like plants do, the same with the algae. What happens is we can get these big blooms of algae from all of these extra nutrients that can outcompete other organisms for one, they can stop sunlight from getting towards the bottom of the lake where other plants need sunlight. And when these organisms die, these tiny single-celled cyanobacteria or algae, they settle to the bottom and are decomposed by bacteria, which uses up all of the available oxygen in the water. You can end up with fish kills and other low oxygen problems, uh, which we have in the Long Island Sound as it is. Once again, this is another picture from the same reservoir down in Windsor, Rainbow Reservoir. Um, we had blooms in 2019, 2020, and 2022. We were spared in 2021 because there was so much rain all summer that the water kept cycling through over the dam, so we didn't see this kind of a bloom. Um, this came from excess nutrients and the slow moving water when we did see it in those three years, and it's potentially toxic, a bloom like this. So it reaches into a public health issue when we have too many nutrients in the water. Our next pollutant is gonna be bacteria. So in a stream system, you need to have certain kinds of bacteria that will break down organic material that will decompose. However, in a more urban stream, what you can see from stormwater runoff, again, is harmful bacteria, essentially E. coli that comes from um, animal feces usually that runs off into our surface waters. Um, and so you tend to see higher bacteria levels in areas where you see more people and more recreation, more pets, and also occasionally where there's really heavy wildlife use, um, downstream of a beaver dam, for instance, something like that. Uh, we do monitor for E. coli in the summertime between June and August uh, to make sure that our waters are safe for recreation, uh, especially for our paddlers in the Farmington River. We do post that on our website on frwa.org. All of that data every year. Pardon, the next pollutant we have is chloride from our road salts in the winter time. It used to be that we would drop down sand. Uh, then we realized that the sand wasn't very good. We'll talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> now we have salt. Um, people are just kind of starting to realize that this is a problem. As you can see on the graph here, this is a graph of chloride in the Farmington River. 
over about 14 years and there are some definite trend lines of those chloride levels increasing. It is inorganic chloride. So there is nothing that's going to break it down in a stream system. It just stays there sometimes. Also, it can go into groundwater. We'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> oh, we're gonna talk about it right here, actually. It can percolate down into our groundwater resources. It's not effectively removed by the soil as it goes down with our stormwater. So once again, chloride is becoming an issue. We have been monitoring. Um, this is my colleague Paige here with our YSI Pro DSS multi-parameter monitor, uh, monitoring device. We have a winter salt watch card as well on the left. This is a project that we are a part of, a program we're part of with the Isaac Walton League of America. Um, and if anyone's interested in volunteering to uh, help us sample chloride in any stream near your house, feel free to put that in the chat. We can talk about it later or email me because we are definitely heading up a lot of volunteers and we're trying to always increase the amount of streams that we're monitoring for chloride. Um, the main issues with chloride, aside from it getting into our drinking water and our groundwater, is that it's toxic for a lot of things that live in the water systems, plants and animals alike. It's also not good for our pets if they, you know, really like to drink from the same contaminated area a lot. It can make their tummy hurt, basically. So our last big form of pollution that we get from stormwater is extra sediments. The reason that we use salt now, because um, these sediments and waterways can clog up the tiny spaces in between that gravel you see here. These are fish eggs in a gravel bed. This is the way that they like to lay their eggs because the water can move freely around them and get a lot of oxygen to their little babies as they grow. If this rock bed were to be uh, inundated with a whole lot of dirt and sand flowing into the stream, that would fill in all these tiny spots and it would change the way the water is flowing around these eggs and the fish probably just would decide not to lay eggs in this habitat. Um, same goes for our macro invertebrates, our stream insects that live underneath these rocks or among these rocks, they're important food sources. And if the spaces between these rocks are filled with sediment, they don't have anywhere to go. Uh, let's see, sediments also reduce the amount of light getting to the bottom of the water. So algae that's growing on rocks in the stream bed won't be able to live as easily. And sediment increases water temperature. It brings heat with it, just like the water that's running off from our roofs and from our um, roads. So now that we've gone over everything storm water can do to hurt us, let me just do a quick time check here. Awesome. What can we do to help? Because that's always what people want to know who actually care is how are we going to fix it? Um, it's a big battle because when rain falls, it falls everywhere. And we can only take care of our little yards or, you know, if we have big decision making power, we can take care of our parking lot of, of the business that we own or something like that, our municipal areas but it's really a team effort. It's really collaborative. Um, the biggest way to help mitigate stormwater runoff is to just reduce the amount of it that's getting into our streams. Um, also conserving our drinking water resources and there's always volunteering and supporting organizations. Um, as far as reducing stormwater, there are a variety of things that you can do that include um, using your trees and native plants, disposing of your pet waste, avoiding your pesticides and fertilizers, which will stop the contaminants from getting into the stormwater in the first place. But most of the things that you can do to reduce stormwater fall into a category known as low impact development or green infrastructure, which is simply, it's, it's almost a new paradigm of of engineering where rather than trying to engineer our land as much, we try and work with the land and with the water in the way that it wants to go. So we try and disconnect here. We're uh, creating space between a road and a sidewalk in this graphic where we've got it planted and we have good soil underneath those plants. So the water that runs off the road and the sidewalk is going to go into these plants. It's gonna feed them 
and they're going to help remove some of the nutrients right away in that way. Then it's going to percolate through the soil where there's a lot of other bacterial processes, physical processes that are going to filter that water. Then they end up in the water table having been filtered and cleaned rather than being shunted through a catch basin and a conduit directly into the stream nearby. Essentially, all of low impact and development and green infrastructure has that aim and that goal in mind of letting the water soak in the way that it would in nature if we had never been here. Um, some examples of low impact development are permeable pavement, as you see here, which is just there's a variety of different kinds. It's just a way that you can create your parking space or walking space while still allowing that rainwater to get into the spaces between those little green spaces of grass and infiltrate into the groundwater eventually. We have bioretention basins, which can be as simple as a hole in the ground um, <laughs> that can be near a parking lot or near a downspout gutter that water can drain into and again, just soak in and be filtered naturally through the processes that happen in the soil rather than being shunted directly into our stream. Um, green roofs and rain barrels, similar concept, a little bit smaller scale. You are catching roof water at this point and preventing that from going directly into the stream. And we have rain gardens and streamside buffers. Um, which often can be done in conjunction with a lot of these other implementations, especially the bioretention basins. Uh, a rain garden generally is planted in a depression or a bioretention swale, and it's planted with native plants that like getting their feet wet. So when it rains, you can divert water from your roof or from your parking lot or your driveway towards that rain garden. It can hold the water for a little bit, and then it can allow it to naturally percolate again. Streamside buffers, um, Mary talked about in a little bit of detail a couple of weeks ago, she had a lot of really good information about that. Basically, it's just a planted area next to the stream that um, it, it literally does act as a buffer. It protects the stream and its banks from different kinds of pollution, from erosion, all sorts of things, and it provides habitat for wildlife as well. And at this point, I want to take a moment to ask Stephanie to um, talk a little bit about something that we were going to be doing together, going back to our uh, rain barrel and rainwater collecting from your roof idea. She's got some downspout disconnects from FRWA. Uh, Stephanie, are you with us? Oh, we might have lost her. Oh, there. Can you hear oh. me? Hi. Oh, beautiful. Hello. I can't see the. I can't see a gallery view of people, so I can't see if I'm. Anyway, um, yes. Let's talk about this project. I can also speak a little bit about green roofs and rain barrels, being as I. Take We're it going. away. We're doing okay on time. I'm always used to rushing through these things. I can't slow myself down. So no, this is this is <laughs> fabulous. This is really, really great, Heather. Um a green roof. So I, I had this really ambitious goal of doing a green roof back in 2010. I was living in New Britain and I actually educated the building department about what it was and what it entailed. Um, in the end, it wound up being so expensive that I never did it, but I built a carport that could withstand a green roof so that is something you want to bear uh, take into account if you ever want to do a green roof it is very heavier so you need a structure that can withstand that the other thing I researched was well what kind of vegetation would it take for uh, a green roof in New England because um, you know you need to think about maintenance you need to think about uh, what kind of vegetation is going to be able to withstand our climate and um, there was a place down in Lebanon, I believe, that actually grows the sedum that you would purchase for um, the green roof. So that's generally the best practices um, for what you would do for the vegetation. Um, I'm also uh, looking into writing some regulations or just some guidance as to how we would actually help homeowners and commercial sites, but especially homeowners, do green roofs. And you do want to think about maintenance. So it's just as well I never did do that 
green roof on the carport because I would have done the whole green roof and that would have been 16 feet. And so that would have been quite difficult to actually maintain. And I think the guidance that I'm going to try and create is you think about probably having like a regular roof, but then the 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 part that's like two feet closest to where it drops down uh, to like the gutter uh, potentially, that's where you would have vegetation. So you can get up on a ladder and maintain it if you need to change out the plants if they die. Um, so these are the kind of things I'm thinking about how to um, get some of these um, infrastructure ideas in, but also think about how they might need to be modified or and um, yeah, where were we though with the disconnections? Yes, uh, we were talking about how we wanted, so Farmington River Watershed Association um, acquired, I don't know how you did this, Heather, but you acquired um, some disconnections, right? It's um, like extended gutter systems. Yes, we got them through a grant a funding, pad. yeah. And I have, I have, think I have all of them, don't I? I think I've got them stored somewhere. Um, so what we're looking for are people who are interested in having a little site visit sometime in the spring by me, where we can look at how some of your gutter systems can be disconnected from going onto impervious surfaces, like Heather was talking about, like a driveway, for example. If your water's coming off the roof, going down a drain, hitting the, the, the driveway and running down directly into the street, which then goes into a... A drainage um, stormwater drain system uh, that that's really not great so what we want to do is try and divert that water so it's then being channeled to go into the ground and so it can just percolate down into the ground and really help the system so um, we thought maybe a site visit would be great because then we can talk about maybe some other things we could do on your site and um, Sarah and I are looking to create um, a program in the spring for anyone who's interested to, to meet on Zoom and talk about what those kind of visits would look like and have sort of a collaboration, listen to you as homeowners as well, see what you think. So that's good for now, isn't it, Heather? Sorry, yes, it is. It took me a while to find my mute button to get myself <laughs> off of it. <laughs> Yeah, so um, thank you, Sarah, for putting Stephanie's information and my information as well in the chat. If anyone is interested in having Stephanie come over to your house and talk about um, ways that you can re-divert your rainwater and um, use it more efficiently, contact her. I see some questions in the chat, which is always great. So we'll get back into the presentation so that we can uh, get everyone's questions answered. So, oops. After you've decided to um, rethink your landscaping ideas and all this and put in low income development to reduce our stormwater runoff, sorry, I keep clicking the button. <laughs> Another thing that we can do to protect our water resources is to conserve our drinking water. Um, always, we don't want to waste water. It's, we're on a planet that's blue but most of that water is not drinkable between what we have in our oceans, obviously, between what we have in groundwater that cannot be tapped into, what we have in ice. It's actually a very small amount of our water that is able to be drank and an even smaller amount that's clean enough for us to drink. So keeping those resources and that infrastructure in place longer can be achieved by overall using less of that resource. Um, so Farmington River Watershed Association is part of the River Smart Initiative, which has, you can see at the bottom here, we've got a, a link to riversmartct.org. There's a QR code. This website, River Smart, has a, a ridiculous amount of information on how you can reduce stormwater runoff as well as how you can conserve drinking water resources. So definitely visit that, check out all those resources that are there. It is beyond a toolkit. It's like an entire tool room. It's a workshop <laughs> in and of itself. So ways we can conserve drinking water at home, um, check your appliances. These days, most of them 
are energy star rated and a lot of them are water sense rated as well. Um, and then there's the simple things like taking a quick shower instead of a bath, turning off the water while we brush our teeth, being aware of efficiency when we're washing our dishes and our clothes, although a light load of dishes is still gonna save water compared to hand washing those dishes. A lot of the time they don't mention that. But aside from what you can do inside, turns out we use a whole lot of our water on our lawns. Go figure, after we're talking about low income development and all of this water that's coming down and we're finding ways to get it really quickly into our surface waters, there are also ways like these rain barrels and green roofs and rain gardens that we can take that water and actually use it to help our lawns and to save us on water. Um, experts estimate that almost half of the water we use when we're watering our lawns gets wasted either by evaporation because we're using too heavy of a, a mist rather than droplets of water. It gets you know, blown away by the wind. We water too much. We water our sidewalks by accident sometimes. So there's a lot of tips that you can use in your lawn when it comes to watering in the summertime mainly. Um, do it in the morning before the sun comes out so that we're not just evaporating the water as soon as it's hitting the grass. Um, using sprinklers that don't provide a mist or produce a mist. Again, that's just going to get blown away by the wind and evaporate. Um, don't over fertilize. Fertilizer makes your grass require more water. As much as it's really, really nice to have the prettiest, darkest green grass, Sometimes that extra fertilizer really isn't needed and you can still have a really pretty lawn without extra fertilizer. Um, and rain barrels, as we were talking about before, can collect water and you can use that later on to water your plants if you have rain barrels set up at your downspouts from your gutter system. Uh, other things that we can do to help conserve our potable water and use less of it in our landscaping is just to try not to water more than we need to. Um, a lot of us, you know, we're busy. We have our sprinklers on a timer, something like that. But there are uh, things you can buy that will, like there are rain sensors that you can install on your sprinkler system so that you're not going to be watering your lawn while it is actively raining. It helps. <laughs> Let's see, um, making sure that your sprinklers, pardon, are watering the lawns and not the asphalt on your sidewalk. Uh, letting your grass grow a little bit longer actually helps it to grow a deeper root system, which can soak up more water and soak up water more efficiently. Also, the blades of the taller grass will help to shade the soil and prevent some of the water that's on your ground already from evaporating off. Um, planting native species generally don't require as much water because they live in this climate naturally. So they don't really need as much extra. Um, mulching around your trees and plants helps again to hold that water in the soil so it doesn't evaporate off. Um, once again, to reiterate all of this information about the stormwater runoff and conserving drinking water can be found on riversmartct.org. Tons and tons of resources. So the last two ways that you can help, uh, one is to volunteer for local organizations. Um, FRWA does invasive plant removals. There are community cleanups. Um, this picture on the right here is Barber Pond here in Bloomfield. Uh, Mill Brook goes through Barber Pond. And right now you can see these clumps of green in the foreground of the photo. That is an invasive water chestnut, the European water chestnut. We are going to be trying to work with the Connecticut River Conservancy in the spring to actually get volunteers to go out into the water with kayaks and big garbage bags and gloves and pull these water chestnuts out before they can seed next year. Um, we also, at this picture on the bottom here, we hold our annual Farmington River cleanup. This year we had uh, sites in Bloomfield for the first time, well, one site in Bloomfield, which again was at Barber Pond here. We had a work group come out and they pulled all of that out of the woods on the Bloomfield bank on the river. We didn't, we didn't even get to the other side of the, the pond, <laughs> the Windsor side. So um, 
visit frwa.org and join our email list. We will always post on there when we have volunteer opportunities coming up. So just uh, keep an eye out if you wanna get involved. If you can't volunteer, you can always support your local conservation organizations that do this work on a regular basis to try and keep our watersheds and our lands healthy. Um, there's us FRWA, Park Watershed, which did the presentation a couple weeks ago, the Winton Berry Land Trust in Bloomfield and the North Central Conservation District is part of the Connecticut Conservation District system. The North Central is the one that serves Bloomfield. And I believe that's all I have for my presentation. This is our, uh, our little mascot, Han Solo. He's about eight months old now, but I just put him there because he's cute. <laughs> and I mostly wanted to have my email address up here in case anybody needed to email me with questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive into the chat into everybody's questions here. Ooh, we got a lot. All right, we're gonna start off. I have this from Sarah Ray, um, not from Sarah Ray, from somebody else through Sarah Ray. Okay, and the question is, are green roofs an option for existing homes? Um, you were thinking of peaked roofs and not a flat roof. If, when you say peaked roof, you probably mean a roof that would be too steep to hold a green roof sort of structure. Um, you can do, uh, a green roof that is slanted, but you want it to be a really gentle, gentle pitch. And you do need, um, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, you need to actually add extra infrastructure to make sure that your green roof can hold the weight of all of the water that falls onto it, as well as all of the plants that are going to be on it. So that becomes an issue um, in homes and the peak roof. Yeah, it's just very, very difficult to keep everything from sliding down on a steeper roof. Next question from Dave. Do we have any charts that show temperature readings for the Farmington River, Salmon Brook, Cherry Brook, et cetera, for the past year and previous years? Yes, Dave, we do. Um, if you want to provide me with your email, either through the chat or you can email me directly. We can send that data over to you next week. Um, same goes for anyone else who wants any of our temperature data. What we do um, with our data for temperature is we share it with um, Connecticut Deep. It's done through their VSTEM monitoring network. VSTEM is an acronym for volunteer stream something, something, monitoring something, something but we send them all of our data every year, um, but we're happy to share it with anybody who wants to see it. Teresa, what can we do in the winter when we take in our rain barrels? If you really want to, you can collect snow and save it. Um, otherwise, in the winter time, it's, mm, it comes down more. I think the most important thing right now from FRWA's standpoint that you can do in the winter to help your watershed is to um, keep an eye on chloride. The road salts tend to be the biggest issue right now. We have our Winter Salt Watch Volunteer Program, which again, I didn't make a slide for it, but if anyone is interested, please email me. Um, what this volunteer program entails is we send you a kit that has four test strips. You go to your local stream that's running by your house or your favorite spot to go sit at four times throughout the winter dip the strip in the, well, you collect a water sample, dip the strip in it, and then you send us either a picture of that strip on a little card that comes in the kit with you as well, or you can, um, some people like to make a spreadsheet if they're doing several sites and send us the data that way. It's really flexible. It's a really easy program. That is one thing you can definitely do to help in the winter. Also, we have um, a lot of tips on our website and in our newsletter that's coming out very soon. And that actually also went out with a, an appeal letter recently about things that you can do around your house to help reduce chloride runoff. Um, mainly that would include scattering your salt rather than dumping it. You, when you scatter salt on your driveway, you really would, it's almost better to do it right at the very beginning of your snowstorm before you build an ice barrier there so that it can start melting right away before it gets 
um, before there's too much there for the salt to work with. And you wanna scatter it lightly. So it actually, each grain has more surface area and contact with the snow or the ice. Um, it's really tempting to just dump it and then try and crush it in. That's really not helping. Scatter it lightly. When you find that it didn't snow as much as we thought it would and the next day everything is dry and you still see salt, sweep it back up and use it again later. That's a really big one you can do at home. Uh, another one is get in touch with your um, municipal uh, department of public works and make sure that they are paying attention to how much salt they're putting down. Um, a lot of places, including my town, Meriden, that I live in, they use a salt brine before a storm, which saves them money. And it also reduces the amount of salt that's going to just bounce off the road from the truck. Um, there's a lot of different ways that all sorts of organizations are coming out with to use salt more efficiently so that we're putting less of it down. Uh, let's see before I'm getting myself carried away here now talking about salt. Anyone wants to talk more about salt, you can email me. <laughs> um, so yeah, when we take in the rain barrels, I think the most important thing, you know, that you can worry about if you want to keep saving water, again, you can save that snow and just melt it and find a place to keep it. But definitely reducing the amount of salt that you're using on your driveway and your sidewalk is a big one and convincing your friends to try and do the same. Uh, Stephanie, can we talk about our fabulous smart lawn care resources at FRWA? That uh, would be our, uh, a lot of that would be in our River Smart program mostly. We do also on our website have um, some pesticide free lawn care information. We have for river friendly landscaping tips. Those are all on FRWA.org. We've got lots of that. Uh, let's see. Teresa, we have replaced much of our lawn with native plants and natives don't need to be watered. Yes. Yeah, a lot of the time native plants, because they already lived here before on their own, they're used to the amount of water that Connecticut gets. So they don't really need too much extra. They're usually very tolerant to our weather conditions when you use native plants. Um, Lisa. Dark green lush lawns are ugly because they scream chemicals. Give me clover and other things too. I agree, Lisa. I love seeing clover in lawns. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, I, for a long time, I feel like the lawn has been a sign of status. And it, for what? In my opinion. <laughs> so hopefully we can all work maybe towards having a few more natural spaces on the edge of our lawns. That's what I try and do. I moved into this house in uh, 2021 last year and we have a nice little postage stamp with a nice little fence and it was all grass with one big shade tree and I just kind of keep creeping in on the borders near my fence and planting more things inside <laughs> and trying to get rid of that grass. Um, a great thing, uh, I guess a good rule of thumb that you can kind of try and push with people, convincing them to get rid of their grass is not going to work. But if you say, you know, just keep the grass that you use for your fire pit or for playing soccer in the yard and plant out the other areas, then you have more shade, more water efficiency, kind of, you can kind of ease that in sometimes. <laughs> um, Stephanie is creating a program with a resident who can talk about how he too has converted his lawn to useful plants that are zero to low maintenance. Fantastic. We spend a lot of time. <laughs> Water is not the only thing we use a lot of on our lawns or money, time as well. Um, Sarah, you've got a vegetable garden in your front yard. That's fantastic. I love that. And let's face it, watching the grass grow is boring. Watching your vegetables grow is a lot of fun. Let's see, Stephanie, you're gonna come and do water chestnut removal with us. That's fantastic. I'm sure you're on our mailing list, I hope. I think so. <laughs> but I'll make sure we contact you either way. We'll get to you uh, specifically. And oh, we got more coming in. Dave is thinking there's only so much impact the 20 people on this call can have. True. How do we think bigger municipal involvement, state legislation, et cetera? 
Um, so municipal involvement, um, I mentioned a couple minutes ago with the salt thing, that's definitely something that you can just call and talk to them directly and just ask what they're doing. Um, FRWA does try every year to link up some of our communities in our watershed with Yukon's Green Snow Pro training. Um, I'm gonna put that in the chat, actually. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I did invite Public Works to actually do the training and I was told they'd done some sort of training of their own. And then I see an email thread about a year later saying, hey, look at this program, we should probably do it. I'm like, I thought we'd done it. So it might be nice to actually have a resident call and find out exactly where we are on that program. Um, but I know they, 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 they are smart about these things. They are using the brine solution. They are thinking about how um, it's in, you know, how they manage the, the storms um, through those methods could be not only financially expensive, but also expensive on the environment. So I believe the public works have this under control, but it doesn't hurt for a resident to actually call and find out and then report back to us. That might be nice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, the more times um, something like this ends up on somebody's answering machine or on their desk of a concerned citizen, the more it goes into their minds. You know, even though a lot of the time it's a really slow process getting that kind of change done, it does make a difference when you, the actual human being who lives in this town, contact someone. Um, as far as state legislation, uh, FRWA has worked with a lot of different state legislation, stream flow studies thing, or stream flow regulations being a big one of them. Um, one right now that we are trying to keep an eye on is that nutrient pollution that caused that big green cyanobacteria bloom in Rainbow Reservoir. Um, with our wastewater treatment facilities, we're trying to keep an eye on when their permits are up which is public information, so that we can kind of put pressure on them to um, up the ante a little bit with their removal efficiency of nitrogen and phosphorus. You know, they all do different kinds of monitoring, different kinds of testing in their effluent waters before putting them back into the stream, but there's always room for improvement there. Um, other than that, a lot of it is just keeping up with you know, environmental bills that are proposed, things like that. Anything that you think that, you know, the state can help with, you can write a letter to your congressman for. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to stormwater runoff, because once again, that's a non-point source and the rainwater flow falls everywhere, that one is really hard to mitigate with any sort of regulations. Um, what you can do is get your town involved in uh, some sort of initiative, a River Smart initiative, uh, a reduced stormwater initiative, something as simple as getting those stencils that say drains to waterway and getting the town to let you spray paint that on your catch basins. It's a small move, but every little move makes an impact. Uh, let's see, Teresa has given us what looks like a fun but disparaging article here to read later. Um, oh, perfect. Sarah's gonna try and act, attach it to the follow-up email. What is the best thing to do to help sidewalks not be slippery? Yeah, that's a big one. Um, when we're you know talking about chloride and road salts, the biggest thing we have to keep in mind is that yes, the environment is super, super important, but public safety is also super, super important. We can't be sliding around. We need to have something to keep that ice from being unsafe for us to walk on or to drive on. Um, when it's a sidewalk at your house, the amount of sediment that you would be providing by using a sand salt mixture is very negligible. So um, I'd say you can definitely go ahead and throw some dirt down on your sidewalk if you wanna get away from using salt entirely. Um, another thing that you can do is I mentioned the, the brine that some municipalities are using. I actually make one here at home. It's you buy the salt that you would normally throw on the ground. You mix it in hot water. It's a one to three. So a 25% solution, essentially 
I believe the magic number is 23%, but it's a quarter salt, three quarters water. And you can actually put that in a garden sprayer and spray your sidewalk before it snows. That treatment will actually stop the falling snow from preventing or, or from forming an ice barrier, like, and really getting in contact with your sidewalk. It kind of buffers that so that it's easier to remove that snow later when you go to shovel or snow blow. It's easier to come up with a nice clean sidewalk. This is only effective um, down to a certain temperature, but that certain temperature is one that we will only see a couple times here in Connecticut in you know, our zone five, zone six hardiness zones. We're not really getting into the negative 10s, negative 20s here very often. So usually that brine idea can help a lot. Um, but definitely, you know, another thing you see with salt is people putting down the big pile of salt because that crunch is a lot easier to navigate than the slippery ice underneath it. Um, that's a situation where you can replace some of that salt with sand and throw that down on your sidewalks in your house or near your house. Um, and oh, that last one is me talking about green snow crow training. <laughs> well, we've got five minutes. I don't know if there's anything else as far as questions or if Sarah, you want to uh, get us wrapped up and give everyone a couple minutes back. Yeah, we'll just, I'll, uh, I gave everybody the power to unmute if anybody wanted to vocalize their quick question while we still have Heather. I'll, we'll pause for 10 seconds, jump in. Okay, with that, I will send everybody a follow-up email with some of the things that we mentioned. I'll also send Heather and Stephanie's contact information um, and reach out to them with more questions about how to get involved. And I'm going to stop this recording now.